What is up everyone? My name is Joseph and welcome back to another episode of Understanding CEDH. The goal of this series is to give the information that you need in order to start playing CEDH or to just become a little bit more familiar with it and just be a little bit more informed in general. The series is aimed at those who are in the introductory level of CEDH but can also be helpful for those who have a bit more experience. In this episode, we're going to talk about some commander-specific win cons and how you can stop them. In a previous video, we did one of just general win cons and took some common win cons and picked them apart. In this one, we're going to do the same thing with five specific commanders. If you do like this style of video where we go on specific commander-based combos, let us know, and we can do another list of maybe some lesser played commanders and some combos that are based on them. That being said, as you can see on screen, we'll be doing the following five commanders and the combos associated associated with them in today's video, Gitrog, Yisan, Elsha, Najila, and Godo. Before we get into it, a few quick promotions for the channel. If you do like what we do and want to help support us, we have a Patreon. Link is in the description. We also have a TCG affiliate link. If you're planning on buying cards and want to help out the channel at no cost to you, you can take advantage of that. And we have a Discord as well if you want to keep up to date with us and just join our community. Now with all of that out of the way, let's get into the first commander for today's episode, the Gitrog Monster. Now, if you're just getting into or have been in the scene for any amount of time, you've probably heard of the infamous Gitrog Dredge combo, and we're going to take the next few minutes to go through step by step how the combo generally works, and then we'll go into what you can do in order to stop this combo from happening or interact with it if it has already started. By the end of this section, you should have a good idea of what the Gitrog player is going to be trying to do. So put simply, the Gitrog player is going to be looking to draw their library and infinitely loop a spell or some ability in order to kill the table. They'll do this by utilizing the dredge mechanic on the card Dakmore Salvage, as well as a discard outlet and Gitrog's own ability. But that doesn't tell you too much, so what's the exact combo? Well, before we get into it, I have a quick disclaimer. We have a very limited amount of time for this video, so if you want to delve deeper into this combo and this commander more than I'll get into here, there's a few links in the description for primers as well as a very extensive Google Doc that does a really good job at picking apart this commander and explaining everything you need to know. For the sake of time, we're going to focus on more general situations, however, I do highly suggest you check those out. Okay, so enough disclaimers. How does the combo work? Well, the first thing you're going to need to know is what prerequisites are the Gitrog player going to need in order to start this combo. Well, for the situation I'm going to explain, which is a situation that can be done at instant speed, they will need the Gitrog monster on the battlefield, any discard outlet in play, a way to get Dakmore Salvage into their graveyard at least one time, and one black mana available. So the first thing they're going to want to do is draw their library. So let's say they meet all of those prerequisites. What's the combo they're going to take in order to draw their library? This part's actually pretty simple. If you've heard some scary things about this combo, it really boils down to a few simple specific steps that just have to get looped in a specific way. So to draw your library, again, relatively simple. The normal course of action is going to be the player will discard Dakmore Salvage using either something like a Putrid Imp or an Oblivion Crown in order to put a Gitrog draw trigger on the stack. They'll resolve that draw trigger by replacing it with Dredge. So they'll mill two cards and then put Dakmore Salvage into their hand. If either of those cards are a land, another Gitrog draw trigger will go on the stack. If neither of those are lands, then nothing will go on the stack, and if one of those cards was a Shuffle Titan, one of the two Titans that are normally run in this list, then a Shuffle Trigger will go on the stack. If a Shuffle Trigger is put on the stack, the Shuffle will happen and you'll continue this loop as normal. If nothing was milled of relevance, you'll continue the loop as normal. If a land was milled and a draw trigger goes on the stack, in response to that draw trigger, they're going to want to discard Dakmore Salvage in order to restart this combo while stacking up these draw triggers. For the method I'm about to explain, they'll be stacking up an absorbently high amount of draw triggers. Once these draw triggers are all stacked up, the Gitrog player will continue the loop until they hit one of the Shuffle Titans like Kozilek. They'll shuffle their graveyard into their library and then resolve the amount of draw triggers needed in order to draw exactly their library. Now they have no library, no graveyard, and all of their cards in their hand. So what are they going to do to win now that they're at this state with all of those draw triggers on the stack? 
Well, the easiest course of action, again, like I said, at instant speed, is to first, for one mana, cast Dark Ritual. When it resolves, they'll float three black mana, and it will go to their graveyard. They will then discard their Shuffle Titan to shuffle both the Titan and the Dark Ritual into their library, and then they'll resolve two of their draw triggers, drawing both of those cards to their hand, and then repeating this loop to generate an infinite amount of black mana. With this mana, there's quite a few things that can be done. My personal favorite, because it's easy, is to use something like Ebony Charm to deal one damage to everyone, and then loop that spell like you would loop Dark Ritual. However, using this line means that you have to have a somewhat dead card in your deck, that being Ebony Charm. So because of that, some very smart people have come up with way more efficient lines. That means you don't have to have these dead cards in your library. Those lines involve things like Deathrite Shaman Loops, or something like using all your mana to cast all of your creatures and then cast a massive finale of devastation and swing out. Now, you may be wondering a few different things. If we're doing this all at instant speed, how are we going to cast Deathrite Shaman, finale of devastation, or even get green mana? Well, it's quite simple. Either, if it's on your turn, you just resolve all of those draw triggers by discarding a Shuffle Titan, shuffling it back into your library, then resolving one draw trigger to draw it, do that until all the draw triggers are used up, or something like an Emergent Zone will be used to be able to cast all of this stuff at instant speed. Now, the infinite green mana is a little bit harder. There are some more steps in order to loop something like a Lotus Petal in order to get infinite green mana. We're not going to go into that. However, there are sorcery speed options to generate infinite colors of something that's not just black. I don't want to go into it for the sake of time, but a TLDR is they will just loop this spell over and over using the draw triggers from Gitrog and Dakmore's Dredge in order to just effectively infinitely cast and sacrifice Lotus Petal. So that's the combo and that's at least one way of how they're going to win. So how can you interact with it and how can you stop it from happening? So the first thing I want to talk about are permanent based pieces that you can play in order to prevent them from being able to combo off. The first one pretty obviously is extreme graveyard hate. I say extreme because it needs to actively and continually get rid of their graveyard. So something like a rest in peace that exiles all graveyards or a ley line of the void that will make it really difficult for them to get around. Another really good preventative measure that you can take in order to stop this combo is things that prevent multiple draws per turn. So like a Narset Parter of Veils, a Spirit of the Labyrinth, or a Notion Thief will prevent them from at least being able to draw their library. They will be able to still stack up the draw triggers with something like a Notion Thief, but they won't be able to resolve them without having an answer to your Notion Thief because you would take the draw instead. Now, this may have be negative for you, they may try to draw you out, however, if you're drawing your library, there's a good chance you're going to be able to have an answer for their combo and then eventually make it back to your turn. Another effective piece that can be used to slow down this combo are Rule of Law type effects. Cards like Rule of Law, Deafening Silence, or an Eidolon of Rhetoric will make it really hard for them to use their mana effectively. Now, they can still get around it slightly. For example, through Deafening Silence, they could cast all their creatures and use the one spell they cast that's a non-creature to be Finale of Devastation pumped up a lot. However, if they don't have access to the green mana, they're not going to be able to loop Lotus Petal, for example. So it definitely makes them at least think much harder and work much harder to get around these hate pieces in order to win. Another good way to at least slow down the Gitrog player in general is activated ability hate. Now, not all activated ability hate effects like a Curse Totem or a Linvala Keeper of Silence that stop creature abilities will stop the combo straight up. For example, an Oblivion Crown does get around that. However, something like a Suppression Field will stop the discard outlets from being able to be activated for free. It'll make them pay mana for it. Another good side benefit of something like a Curse Totem or a Linvala is that it will slow them down as they're not going to be able to use their mana dorks very effectively if they can't activate them. So it gives you a good chance to slow them down and get your board state in a state where you can win before they're able to get around your hate pieces. Similarly, another good at least sorcery speed option is creature hate. So not necessarily a permanent, but something like a pyroclasm, a rolling earthquake, or toxic deluges allow you to slow them down and slow down their early ramp, making it much harder for them to cast Gitrog and the Oblivion Crown and tutor up the pieces they need. So it doesn't straight up stop them, but it makes it much harder for them to get the pieces they need on the battlefield. Now, that's the more sorcery speed type of answer. What's some instant speed interaction that you can have that can stop this from happening? The first one's going to, very obviously, be counter spells. 
If you stop Gitrog from hitting the battlefield, they really can't do anything. There are lines that they can win without something like Dak more Salvage, and they run enough shuffle effects to where it'd be very difficult to exile all of them, but without Gitrog, the combo really can't take off. So countering Gitrog is a good way to stop this from happening. However, that's not always possible. Things like Cavern of Souls exists, so what other interaction can you have to slow down or stop this combo? Now, single target removal is a good option, however, it's not a definite option. This combo can be done at instant speed, so for example, if they discard Dakmore Salvage to start their combo off, you can try to remove Gitrog, however, if they have another land in hand, they're able to just discard that land and put another draw trigger on the stack to start the combo above your removal spell. So since this can all be done at instant speed, it's possible that they can get around some instant speed creature removal, and it's much harder to deal with. So keep that in mind when you're playing against these players. Maybe think twice about relying on a Pongify rather than some type of hard counter spell. In conclusion, the Gitrog monster is fairly resilient and pretty fast, so when playing against the Gitrog monster, make sure you're prepared to deal with this type of a combo. That being said, I do want to stop it here. If you want more information, check out the links in the description. It'll give you much, much more in-depth information on the Gitrog monster and how the combos work. But let's move on to the next commander-based win con, Yisan the Wanderer Bard. The combo lines that Yisan utilizes are a little bit simpler than the combos the Gitrog monster uses, so this section should be a little bit more manageable. That being said, I do want to go over how Yisan players normally win, what their goals are, and how you can stop them. So, what is the main goal of the Yisan player? Well, put simply, they want to utilize Yisan's ability to quickly tutor up a series of creatures, while also using untap effects like a Quarion Ranger in order to tutor up multiple things in a single turn. But what are they going to be tutoring up and how can you put a stop to it? Well, in general, the combo line or the tutor line isn't necessarily a single combo per se. The tutor lines more allow for the winning pieces that they need to be put on the battlefield a little bit easier and a little bit more quickly than normal. So what do they use normally as a win outlet? Well, a very popular one is Crater Hoof Behemoth. I don't think I need to say too much. If they're tutoring up for Crater Hoof Behemoth, they've already at least tutored up seven other things and it's a very good chance that they've played other creatures along the way, so they're going to have a massive board if that enters the battlefield. Another efficient creature-based line that Yusan can tutor up is something like a Teemer Sabertooth plus a creature that taps for 5 plus mana, a Wirewood Symbiote, and an Elf. This combo will allow the player to, let's say, tap a Priest of Titania for 6 green mana, use Wirewood Symbiote's ability to bounce an Elf and untap Priest, and then use some of that mana to activate Teemer Sabertooth, bouncing the Wirewood Symbiote, and then using some more of that floating mana to replay those two cards. This allows for infinite amount of green mana generation, and once the infinite mana has been obtained, it allows for infinite ETBs from something like a Crater Hoof or a Regal Force by using Teemer Sabertooth's ability to bounce it and then the mana to replay it. So those are some creature-based combos that the Yisan player is going to look to tutor up. However, there are some more win outlets that they are going to try to utilize, and some popular ones are Umbral Mantle and Staff of Domination, both allowing for untap effects or card draw effects that allow them to win the game, but we're going to focus on the Yisan specific lines for this video. Now, if you're looking for specific things on what the Yisan player is going to do and how they're going to play the game, I will leave another link in the description for the Yisan Primer that links to a very in-depth and well thought out and thorough Google Doc that documents all of this. But for the sake of this video, just keep in mind that they're going to be activating Yisan to tutor up the pieces they need to get some of those combos online. If you do frequently play against the Yisan player and do want to learn the deck more thoroughly, again, I highly suggest those links. But now let's talk about hay pieces and interaction pieces that you can slot into your deck in order to deal with the Yisan player. Let's first talk about permanent and sorcery speed hate pieces. One of the easiest ones I find to slot in are cheap and efficient board clears. Spells like Pyroclasm or Toxic Deluge or Rolling Earthquake do a good job to keep the Yisans player board clear. If they're constantly being set back by board clears and can't establish a good board state or decent ramp, they're going to have a hard time getting multiple tutors off in a single turn cycle. Another good way to stop the Yisan player is activated ability hate. Things like a Cursed Totem, a Suppression Field, a Lunvala Keeper, a Silence, or even some single target ability hate like a Phyrexian Revoker or a Pithing Needle do a really good job at slowing down the Yisan Tutors. 
Sure, Suppression Field doesn't stop mana dorks from tapping for mana like Curse Totem or Linvala do, but it does make the Yisan tutoring a lot harder. So it might be the weaker option of these, but it's still a decent slot if you find yourself playing against a Yisan player often. Another really efficient thing to slot into your deck are anti-search effects. Cards like Avon Mind Sensor or, in the right deck, a Stranglehold can do a lot of work to prevent the Yisan player from searching up the cards they need, making it much harder for them to find their combo pieces. Another good hate piece that's more permanent based is things that prevent creatures from entering the battlefield from the library. So a card like Containment Priest or Graph Digger's Cage will both disallow the tutoring from being successful. Sure, they may be able to search up that combo piece using Yizan's ability, but it won't be able to enter the battlefield. And finally, the last category I have listed here are anti-enter the battlefield effect hate pieces. So, something like a Torpor Orb, a Hushbringer, or a Takali Honor Guard do a decent job at stopping at least the win conditions that the Yisan player will be going for. It doesn't always stop all of them, but it can put in a lot of work in stopping a Craterhoof Behemoth or a Regal Force, and just in general, if these cards don't affect you, they're very valuable to slot in with the current meta and with what current good win conditions are. So, now that we're done talking about permanent based hate pieces, let's talk about some instant speed interaction. The first one, and what I have found to be the easiest, is single target removal for Yisan. Something like a Pongify, or a Chain of Vapor, or a Swords to Plowshares just gets rid of the problem before it starts. Sure, they can still play their mana dorks and use them, but now they have to choose whether they're going to again pay for Yisan for a second or third time, or if they're going to try to just draw, control the game, and grind it out. So it really puts a damper on what their main game plan is. Another good piece of interaction, and this one's going to be in probably every section, Counter spells. In terms of countering spells in a Yisan deck, if you can counter Yisan and keep Yisan off the table, similar to the single target removal, you're going to stop a lot of what they're trying to do and make it much harder for them to find the pieces they need. Even if you only have one creature counter in your deck and you choose to counter Yisan rather than anything else, and then five or six turns down the line they hard cast a Crater Hoof Behemoth, you probably still kept them off of that Crater Hoof for a few turns by getting Yisan out of the picture and gave yourself a little bit more time to establish what your win condition is. So, in terms of counter spells, Yisan is a really good target. Keeping all of these things in mind will help you keep an opening hand, know how to plan your plays during the game, and even more simply, have a better idea of which cards to choose to slot in during the deck building process. Now with Yisan out of the way, let's talk about a little bit of a more newer commander, Elsha of the Infinite. Elsha is a commander that I actually latched onto very early after they were spoiled, and so I'm really happy that this deck is actually to the point where it's somewhat commonly played and considered to be powerful. So what is the combo that Elsha uses, and how can you stop it? So to put it simply, the Elsha specific combo that the Elsha player is looking to perform is to draw their library using a mana reducer for artifacts as well as Sensei's Divining Top. Now there are other combos that the Elsha player is going to slot into their deck and we'll hit on them briefly in a bit, but we're going to focus really on the Elsha specific ones and how you can stop Elsha's combo. Just as a quick aside, the combos that are not Elsha specific that I'll go over are good examples of combos that we'll have in the non-commander specific videos. I don't want to get too in depth in them on this video because I do want to focus primarily on the combos that require a specific commander. So anyway, how does this combo work? Well, let's go over the prerequisites first. The things that will need to be on the battlefield for this combo to start is Elsha, as well as a mana reducer for artifacts, so a Cloud Key, an Ethereum Sculptor, or occasionally something like a Helm of Awakening, and a Sensei's Divining Top. The way the combo works is the player will tap Sensei's Divining Top to draw a card and put the Divining Top back on top of their library. Then, using Elsha's ability, they will cast the Sensei's Divining Top from the top of their library, and it will cost 0 mana due to the mana reducer, reducing it by 1. They'll repeat this process until they draw their entire library, and then they'll win the game however you do win the game with your library in your hand. There is a less common combo involving Elsha and Proteus Staff, and it's a build that was theorycrafted towards the beginning. I don't see it too commonly used now, but I did want to mention it. This build requires the deck to have zero other creatures in the deck other than Elsha, and the combo goes as follows. 
with Elsha and Proteus Staff on the battlefield, activate Proteus Staff to target Elsha. And what this allows you to do, since the staff reads that you can put the cards back in any order and you have no other creatures, you'll go through your entire library, put Elsha back on the battlefield, and then the player would be able to order their library however they want, so they could put all of their win conditions on top and then just cast them using Elsha's ability since she can play the top card. It's not commonly used because the restriction of no other creatures is fairly difficult, but I did want to mention that one. Other common win outlets for an Elsha build are kind of common Jeskai win conditions, so something like an Underworld Breach, an Alliance Eye Diamond, and a wheel like Wheel of Fortune to mill your opponents and draw the cards you need. There are Time Twister loops that are commonly played, but I really don't want to get too in-depth in those. I think they should have their own sections in another video devoted to win cons that aren't commander specific. That being said, that is how you can win with Elsha. So how can you, the person playing against Elsha, stop this from happening and interact with it once it starts? Well, again, like always, let's start with the hate pieces that you can play to make their lives much more difficult. The first thing I want to go over are stacks pieces that increases the cost of spells. So cards like Sphere of Resistance or Thorn of Amethyst or Thalia Guardian of Thraben. These spells will make it so Sensei's Divining Top no longer casts just one mana, so they'll need multiple mana reducers in order to constantly replay the spell. It's actually surprisingly efficient in stopping what the Elsha player has in store. Another good hate piece are cards that hate out artifacts, so something like a Collector Oof, or a Stony Silence, or a Null Rod. Not only will this stop them from winning, but it will stop them from ramping out. Since they don't have access to green, they're going to be relying on artifacts to ramp out, so not only does this stop their win, it also slows down their early game. Another good way to stop the Elsha player are Rule of Law type effects. So cards like Rule of Law, Deafening Silence, or Eidolon of Rhetoric stop them from being able to repeatedly cast Sensei's Divining Top, really making it difficult for them to work around that and go after their main combo line. Another good way to stop them are anti-draw effects. So something like a Narset Parter of Veils, Spear to the Labyrinth, or a Notion Thief makes it incredibly difficult for them to get cards in their hand. As mentioned before, with the Notion Thief, they would be able to technically draw you out, but ideally, you're going to draw into an answer before they're able to do that, so just keep that in mind when playing Notion Thief against this type of player. The last piece of permanent hate that I wanted to talk about is Graph Digger's Cage. This card makes it so they're not able to play spells from their library, so they won't be able to cast Sensei's Divining Top. There aren't many cards that have this effect for non-creatures, so Graph Digger's Cage is kind of just a good catch-all if it doesn't end up affecting you. That being said, if the combo is started, or if you don't have any of these hate pieces around but you have interaction, how can you effectively use interaction to stop them from winning? Well, similar to a lot of these commander-based combos, single target removal is going to be pretty relevant. So, something like a Pongify, or a bounce spell like Chain of Vapor, or a Swords to Plowshares. But when is it the best time to use these spells? In my opinion, the best time to remove Elsha is when top is being tapped in response to that draw. This will allow them to draw a card, but it will also put top back on top of their library after Elsha is destroyed. If you had waited to respond to the Sensei's Divining Top cast, then Elsha would still be gone, but then they would have the top to generate some card selection and advantage, and this way they're going to have a dud for their next card draw, and you'd slow them down just a little bit more. Another good piece of interaction are Silence Type's effects, so something like Silence or, occasionally, Orm's Chant. They can be fairly effective when stopping an Elsha player, because unlike some of the other combos we talked about, they will have to cast one spell per card drawn, so a Silence can really screw them over. The last thing I want to talk about, and you saw it coming, but Counter Spells. Counter spells will obviously stop a commander-based combo because if you can stop the commander from hitting the battlefield, you'll stop them from performing this combo. But what is the most important thing to counter? Is it the Elsha? Is it the Divining Top? And my answer to that is it kind of depends. Generally, Elsha is going to be getting them the most value, so if you can counter Elsha, go ahead and counter Elsha. 
However, having a creature based counter is a little less common as there's not many good efficient creature based counters. So if you do have to pick another thing to counter, in my opinion, you should target the mana reducer. They're going to be running such an artifact heavy deck. If you can stop them from getting just a little bit of extra value off of Cloud Key, it's going to be fairly significant. The Divining Top is counter worthy in this deck, more so than in other decks. However, I would probably reserve the counter spells for some bigger impact spells, depending on the board state and what you have in hand. That being said, that wraps up our section on Elsha, and I hope you have a better grasp on how to play against Elsha players in the future. So now, let's talk about Najila of the Blade Blossom. Moving on to the fourth commander in this video, we have Najila of the Blade Blossom. The goal of the combo of Najila is pretty simple, to get infinite attack steps and then win through combat damage. But how is Najila able to do this? Now, very clearly it prints right on the card how to get extra combat steps, but how does Najila normally get to that point where they can activate that enough times? So this combo is less of a step-by-step -step combo and more just permanence to watch out for and then we'll get into how you can prevent this from happening. So I have the ways to generate mana separated into three categories based on what I've commonly seen in Najila deck lists. Those categories are generating mana on attacks, generating mana with the tokens created, and the last category is just a revy. So let's get into generating mana on attacks or on damage. Like I mentioned before, this isn't really a step-by-step -step combo, so I'm just going to list out the pieces that you should be worried of and how they're going to effectively use those to generate the mana. The first piece being a Druid's Repository and 5 attackers, this will produce 5 mana. The second category, yes, or subcategory, is Nature's Will, Bear Umbra, and Sword of Feast and Famine if they have 5 lands or lands that can produce one of each color. Now some of these require damage and some of them trigger on attack, but they all effectively do the same thing of untapping all of their lands, allowing them to activate Najila if they get the required mana from those untaps. So that's how they're going to try to generate mana on attack or on damage. So let's talk about how they can use their warriors to generate this mana. Now these lines are a little less condensed, but I still did want to go over them. The main pieces I want to talk about are a card like Cryptolith Rite in combination with something that allows the warriors to untap. So for example, a Cryptolith Rite plus an Intangible Virtue or plus a reconnaissance. The warriors having vigilance or the ability to untap allow them to not only attack, but also be activated with Cryptolith Rite to generate mana. In the third category, which I title Jesterevi, is probably one of the most efficient ways to generate extra mana to generate these combat steps. Now, Derevi Imperial Tactician has a very unique ability, and it is whenever a creature or Derevi deals combat damage, you can untap or tap target permanent. What this allows the Najila player to do is, for example, if they're attacking with five creatures, but they only have a limited amount of mana sources, they can use each of those five Derevi triggers to untap the same permanent. So when they deal combat damage or when they attack, the triggers will go on the stack. They can resolve one of the Derevi triggers to untap one of their lands. They can then tap that land to float mana. They can then use the next Derevi trigger to untap the same land and then tap it for mana. So if they have a lot of dual lands or if they have rainbow lands, they don't need five different lands in order to produce this mana, which is why Derevi is very strong in a Najila deck. Now those are the only ones that I want to cover, and realistically, those all may not be in a Najila deck. Those are just what I found to be the most common ways to generate this mana. So, you, as the person playing against Najila, how can you stop this from happening? What can you slot in to prevent the Najila player from winning? Well, let's talk about hate pieces. And the first thing that I want to talk about is activated ability hate. Cards like Curse Totem and Linvala Keeper of Silence makes it so that they can't activate Najila's ability. Cards like Suppression Field makes it so it's a little bit more difficult. It doesn't outright stop them, but they have to try a little bit harder. And then single target cards like a Phyrexian Revoker or a Pithing Needle can also be used to shut down specifically Najila's ability, which is usually incredibly relevant. Another good piece of permanent board hate is mana control. Something like a Blood Moon or a Magus of the Moon that hates on all of their non-basic lands is going to go a very long way. In a 5 color deck that looks to constantly have all 5 colors, they're going to be running a lot of non-basics, so these cards will definitely put in work. 
Some other good pieces are something like a Collector Oof or a Null Rod. Now, not all Najila decks run a lot of Artifact Ramp, but if they do, these will definitely slow them down, not only from ramping Najila out early, but they'll also do a good job at slowing down the colors that they have access to. Another good piece of Sorcery Speed Hate are cheap and efficient board clears. So something like a Pyroclasm or a Toxic Deluge or Rolling Earthquake. If their game plan is to ramp out Najila early, but they soon run out of gas and have to slowly amass their board of warriors, setting them back a few turns by clearing the board can be incredibly important. They're looking to get the critical mass of warriors they need to generate infinite mana, and if you slow that down, that just gives you that many more turns to get what you need. But moving on from permanent hate pieces, what interaction can you hold up to try to stop what Najila is doing? Well, first off, as we've said many times before today, it turns out single target removal can be very effective when stopping a commander-specific win con. Something like a Pongify or Chain of Vapor or a Swords to Plowshares can go a long way in slowing down the Najila player. One thing that I don't think I've mentioned yet is the fact that since they have a piece of their combo in the command zone, it's really hard to permanently shut them down, but it is very possible to slow them down enough to where you can get ahead. Anyway, moving on from single target removal, let's move on to the second staple of stopping a commander, counter spells. Countering Najila and stopping Najila from entering the battlefield shut off a lot of combos that Najila has in store. There are some lists that do run some Hulk lines or some demonic consultation lines, so depending on the player you may not be shutting them down completely, but turning off Najila shuts off their easy way to victory. So countering Najila can be incredibly effective. One specific counterspell or type of counterspell that stops Najila more so than some other commanders we've talked about tonight are stifle type effects. So something like a trick bind especially is very very good or something like a stifle. If they don't have enough mana to activate it twice, you've bought yourself a turn. And this is relevant for Najila compared to Yisan, let's say, because Najila needs to be in combat in order to win. Yisan can still tutor on the next turn if he was trick binded, but Najila can't really do much if the turn is passed. So a way to stop that activated ability from happening can buy you at least one more turn. That being said, that does wrap up our section on Najila, so let's move on to the last commander for this video, Godo Bandit Warlord. Now when it comes to commander specific win cons, Godo is definitely up there with some of the more recognizable ones. Some other decks will run alternate win cons even if their main win con is based off of their commander, but in mono red, you really have to just go all in on the Godo play. So how can you, the person playing against Godo, stop them from popping off? Well, first, let's talk about what combo they're really looking to get here. Now, this one's not too much of a secret. You probably already know what I'm going to say, but what the Godo player is aiming to do is to cast Godo, search up Helm of the Host, somehow equip it, and then go to combat. What this allows Godo to do is make infinite combat steps and a lot of Godo tokens. And that's kind of it. Usually, I try to give a summary and then go deeper into the combo, but that's, that's pretty much it. The goal of the deck is to use Godo's tutoring ability to search up Helm of the Host, and there are some ways to cheat the equip cost, so it doesn't always cost the full amount of mana, but in essence, the combo and the line is pretty straightforward. Now, when it comes to cheating in these effects, there are some pretty popular ones, and those would be Hammer of Nazan, Brass Squire, Magnetic Theft, something like a Panharmonicon can be super useful to get double ETBs off of Godo so you can search up Hammer of Nazan and then search up Helm of the Host to have it auto-equip, but in essence the combo is pretty straightforward. When Godo goes to combat with Helm of the Host, it'll create a copy of Godo with haste that can swing, and, and when it swings it'll make another combat step, and in that combat step Helm of the Host will trigger again, and you see where this is going. So now that you know what to look for with the combo, how can you interact and stop this combo from happening? So as always, let's start with what good hate pieces you can slot in to stop the Godo player before he even starts. A big one to stop Godo is things that hate on or prevent enter the battlefield effects. So something like a Torpor or a Hushbringer or a Takali Honor Guard will stop Godo's tutoring ability from even going on the stack, and that's incredibly relevant. Especially if the hate piece you're using is one of the white creature based ones, it's kind of difficult to remove a creature in mono red, so you're going to be sending them back quite a bit and making them really search for a specific answer. 
Another good hate piece is anything that shuts down or prevents artifacts from being activated. So Null Rod, Collector Oof, or Stony Silence not only slow down Godo's ramp, but it also prevents things from being equipped because equip costs are activated abilities. And like I mentioned, all of the ramp in Godo, since it is mono red, is going to be pretty artifact based. And since Godo is pretty single focus with what he's trying to do, it plays a lot of artifacts to ramp Godo out fast. So shutting that ramp off makes him at least have to play the spells on curve. And when your combo requires 11 mana, it buys you a lot of time. So artifact hate can be very, very strong. Another good piece of hate is anti-tutor effects. So, even Mind Sensor, a Stranglehold in the right deck, or even something like an Ashiok Dream Render can make it so sure the Enter the Battlefield effect will trigger. However, he's not going to be able to search, or at the very worst, they'll be able to search the top four. And as mentioned before, since the Goto player is in mono red, they're going to have a pretty difficult time removing or interacting with the hate pieces you're putting down. Sure, they do have a lot of artifact destruction, but not a lot of creature destruction. So that can be used to your advantage. That being said, if you don't have the pieces on board when they try to combo off, what are good interaction spots that you can use in order to stop the Godo player? Well, let's start off with everyone's favorite answer, counter spells. Counter spells to stop Godo from being cast or being successfully cast stop the combo altogether. There are very few backup wins in Godo, if any, depending on the deck list, so just preventing Godo from hitting the table can buy you all of the time in the world. That being said, as mentioned before, Cavern of Souls does exist. So if Godo does hit the battlefield, when should you interact and what should you interact with to stop them from doing anything? Well, there's a few different interaction points and they all revolve around removal. So both single target creature removal and single target artifact removal. Both of those can be used to stop the Godo player in their tracks, but when should you use it? Well, in my opinion, the best time to pull the trigger on those instant speed kill spells are when the player goes to equip the Helm of the Host that they tutored up to Godo. Make them use as many resources as possible before you stop them. Sure, you could respond to the ETB effect and kill Godo right then, but you could also just wait until they move to equip the Helm, or until they go to combat. Making them waste all of those resources sets them farther back and gives you a little bit more leeway when you go to your turn. And that quite simply wraps up our section on Godo. Godo is pretty linearly focused, so dealing with a Godo player is usually a little bit easier than dealing with some of the other commanders tonight, but we did want to mention it because it is such a staple when it comes to commander-specific win cons. All in all, I hope this discussion has helped you if you are getting into or just looking for more information on CEDH in general and just giving you the information that you needed in order to take that next step and know what to look for. This type of information for me has been really helpful when learning how to build my decks and knowing what cards to slot in based on the meta and based on what my friends and the other people at the table are playing. A lot of the information that is being presented to you in these videos is information that myself or one of the other members of Casual Competitive has done the research on or experienced, and our goal is that we can use our experience and our research to help you if you are a little bit newer to the scene. That being said, that is all we have for this video. We hope you enjoyed it. If you have any suggestions for other commander-specific win cons that you would like to see a little bit of a deep dive into, let us know in the comments below. And if you have any other topic requests for these types of understanding CEDH videos, again, let us know. We have a few that we're planning on doing, but we'd love to know what you guys would like to see and what you guys would like to learn about. So be sure to let us know if that's something that interests you. That being said, that is all we have for this video. I am Joseph, this is Casually Competitive, and we will see you next time.